Good morning to everyone. Hello, hello. I hope you're still strong and concentrated for a second day. And we will start now. I would, I'm very honored to introduce a very well-known entrepreneur, business leader from the Middle East, from Egypt, chairman of IT Investment Group, who has been involved in uh, IT projects and many other things which he will talk about. And we are very honored that he came for us at this meeting, uh, Isham El Sharif. Please give him a warm welcome. Good morning, thank you. Thank you. Do you want to stand here? Or here? here? Okay. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Well, it's a great, first of all, thank you very much for the introduction. And it's a great pleasure and privilege to be with you here this second day. Let me tell you up front that yesterday I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the meetings and I enjoyed everyone I met from you, even for a few minutes of contact. But it seems that like I'm going to have uh, uh, friends for the rest of life. And uh, if you allow me, that this family is where I belong, what I believe. So no introduction. Today, you're going to have a few problems with me. First of all, I pre put aside the prepared written speech. <laughs> Second, I didn't sleep well. I slept a couple of hours. I don't know why. Uh, third, it's 8.30 in the morning. I mean, why do you need a speech at 8.30 in the morning? <laughs> Well, I'm going to, what I uh, decided, I have a great coach right here and a great friend. And publicly, I told her that I'm going to tell her husband that we're going to be friends lifetime. So I need you all witness, a great distinguished Joe, who's going to take over from me right when I finish. Now, let me share with you a journey that hasn't finished yet. And I would like to conclude this, uh, this 20 minutes by putting one agenda item in addition in front of you to think about and reflect. And this one agenda item, I'm going to put it in an SMS up front for the sake of time. It's knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. And I want you to think if there is one thing that we need to do for the world today what will be it? Well, I started, uh, as you probably know, I'm Egyptian. I'm Egyptian by, by birth. I'm proud of Egyptian, by the way. Egyptian by birth, by nationality. And I got my brainwashing on the east coast of the United States in a place called MIT. But my heart is in the developing world. And my destiny is in a global better world. And I think this is something we share. And after I finished all the math, the sciences of MIT, by the way, I come from a double E, computer science. And then I was not fulfilled. So I said, I like the real world. Let's go to management and business. I was not fulfilled. So I did a joint program. OK, and this is where I got my basic academic background, interdisciplinary across different fields, and try in search of how can we make a difference on ground. Take what we learn to practice and take the challenges of practice back to think about. Think, capital letters, is very important word in my life. Research is very important. But research by itself is meaningless if I don't apply it on the ground. So I am there, this guy, who goes, I was asked, what do you do? The most difficult question that I have in life, because I don't really know what I do. Huh? I always evade the answering the question by saying that by night I dream, sometimes if I sleep. <laughs> and the next day, I go and implement the dream. My dream at MIT was to try to help the developing world, my country. They have nots the poor. 
And I was lucky enough that I had a crazy guru by the name of Peter Keen, who was on Vogue at the time, invented the field of information decision support systems, which came from Carnegie Mellon Computer Science, uh, for, from uh, Carnegie Mellon Decision Making and MIT Computer Science, integrating it, having forefront 1978, first book in information decision support systems. And for the following decade, I was the product. Uh, first PhD to the, in this field. So I was young with a short, but the highest paid person in the, in the East Coast of the United States. And I went and did everything for corporate America. And then one day a friend of mine told me, he became, by the way, the, the uh, Minister of Finance in uh, Turkey. He was working for the, the World Bank, Kamal Darwish. And he told me, Hisham, why don't you, why do you talk about developing world. If you believe in it, go and do, fix, do something about it. So I left <coughs> the post at MIT, and I went with a crazy dream to try to accelerate economic and social development in Egypt. And the dream was to build one information and decision support center that helped the top decision making of the country make a better decision. The assumption was that if he makes a better decision, everything will be. <coughs> and if you do that continuously, you can accelerate economic and social development. Well, 15 years later, instead of building one information decision support center in the cabinet of Egypt, I discovered that I built 1,500 centers in every ministry, in every governorate, in every city, in every district, and in one third of the villages. And starting from a couple of people to 40,000 people working in a country which is data rich, information poor, lousy decision making, everything is unstructured, no information. Started to structure projects around building databases about the legislations which go back to 1824 digitizing every single part of the economy uh, in every single department. So started, the country started to put light using info, using, and top down and bottom up, the country started a new march. And on the way, after the couple of years, we started getting first prize awards in the world in every single, every single thing, information systems, management science, operational research. The best of Egypt, young chefs came and building a new army of technocrats putting to work close to decision makers and marching an economic reform which is next to none. And Egypt growth started to go up from reducing the debt of Egypt from $44 billion to $29 billion to full privatization program, full uh, employment, slash unemployment um, networks, et cetera, et cetera. You can search all of this only. Introducing the internet to Egypt, to the Arab world, to Africa. Lots of projects on the way, up to the digitization of culture in the Egyptian Museum, in Coptic Museum, etc. The whole idea is information for development. What we didn't plan for that is a society that has transformed from industrial age into an information age. These young kids, young chefs, young graduates became an army of innovation. Building an institution, the institution we built, we used to build it by the book, different from the bureaucratic organization that was there. So an organization that's effective, that's efficient, that's socially responsible, that's no smoking, something which is totally strange in, in a developing world. People were looking earlier to us like, who are these strangers? In a few years, we became the heroes and the gurus. After a decade, we became political threat to many. Just out of this tiny organization, in the following decade, about 34 ministers were no nominated those young chefs that I appointed, and two prime ministers. 
this shows either something good or something bad about, again, the integration of these young groups. Having said all of that, and all these remarkable compliments that were taken about information and the use of information, that we are the best in the developing world, etc., 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 but the country really has not developed. What we did, I did not pay attention to is the significance of politics, politicians, corruption, uh, that take place in spite of whatever is happening. Well, instead of continuing all this accelerated growth, we faced with all the prerequisites that led to the revolution. And there was a confrontation. How much of uh, Chatham rule are we applying here? No Chatham rule, so I cannot say everything. Okay, I'm, you, you can guess. Okay, by end of 90, there was sort of confrontation and split where people who believe in what should be done went to one course and other people went to another course. Then years later, those other people who went to the other course went straight to prison. This group, the, other, the, the group of the solidarity group, like, were basically among those who have made the revolution and a new Egypt has been reborn. 10 years later, 15 years later, again, the agenda has not been completed because Egypt and so many other countries with the, pre with the proposition or the hypothesis that information can accelerate growth did not take place because of the political discontinuity that we did not take enough care of the governors from a political point of view and others. Now picking up again. What are some of the lessons? Before that, let me, let me share with you. The success of the 80s and 90s were so uh, attractive to an extent that replicas of this went to the Arab world, to countries in Africa. Maybe in another speech we can share some of these examples. But it is so interesting when you put a new words in the vocabulary of practice. So the word information and decision support center became on the agenda. The word information and society were on the agenda of every country in the Arab world. The word information society has been on the agenda of Africa with the Economic Commission of Africa. A simple thing, in my opinion, I led to put an initiative and got the endorsement of 40 countries. Difficult, yes, but simple compared to other things. However, the impact was just phenomenal. Because later on, the centers that you put for kids in the villages of Africa, the internet, etc., etc., 15, 20 years later, you see huge impact. So you just put the seeds, you build consensus, you build team, you build harmony across continent, across boundaries, and things evolve, if it's right. The challenges now, just I'm going to give you figures by figures very quickly. Egypt, when I was born, it was 20 million. The world was about a billion. Today is 80 million, 80 something. I'm just going to make simple. Uh, it's going to be doubled by year 2050. The Arab world today, again, I'm going to make it simple. It's 360 million, 67 million, say 400 million. By year 2050, it's going to be 800 million, double. Within less than four decades, this region is going to double. All right? Two-thirds of the population is under 20. Africa is a billion. Again, I'm making strong approximation here. It's going to be two billion. If we think from here and think about our issues only, on the backyard, you'll have 800 million 
and behind that, 2 billion. If we continue not doing anything about what's going on, there is 40% poverty, there is 30% illiteracy, these, the countries are at the bottom of quality education, the country are at least in terms of women empowerment, half of the society at least is out, the countries are in the least brackets, I don't want to bore you with, with figures, in terms of entrepreneurship, etc., etc., etc. Unemployment, the best country is 14, 15% unemployment. Something needs to be done, again, top down and bottom up. Either we say it's none of our business, our business is just to bomb some, or to leave it away after we bomb, or we say that there is a moral responsibility with the cost of bombing one day, we can build 1,000 schools. We can build 4,000 kindergartens. We can build a Harvard or an MIT in every country of this region. Okay? And I feel that this is a responsibility of the 21st century citizen. Because at the end, we need to leave, to leave behind one sustainable world for our kids. We don't want to leave them with more and more of the bloodshed that we see on the CNN and BBC daily, and now by the hour, and tomorrow will be by the second, if we don't take care of it today. So what's the challenge? What's, what's the ever challenge? challenge? Is to bring the have-nots in stream. What is our agenda? I, I would say something that I'm doing this fall, woman. Because this is an important and an easy win. Why don't we put an initiative for women across countries of the Mediterranean? I'm inviting, by the way. Okay? I'm not going to do it, but I'm, gonna, I'm inviting. The leaders, many of them I know, others I don't know, but those who believe in women leadership, that it's important, come. Those who believe women empowerment, come. Women inclusion, come. Girls education, come, etc. Put the best of women, to put the best agenda for the initiative, regional and national, to get it moving. Second, youth. We talk about youth. We enjoy conferencing about youth. But how much have we done in youth? Just one example. 85, 86, I put an ad to train 50,000 youth on computers. I'm crazy about investing in, uh, in education. Nobody applied. By year 1999, we used to train 300,000 per year. One institution through multiple operators. The message can be done. You need to focus, you need to push for the dream, and you push the envelope. Okay, so we need to get youth properly trained, and instead of getting a gun and killing someone, we need to get them out to the e-information age, to the digital age. Third, poverty. There is a project today that I'm privileged to be part of it, to create a million job in one year in 4,740 villages. I was personally surprised that it got the highest agenda attention of the government, for obvious reasons. I was even more surprised that they put 10 billion on this project. But the challenge is, and I, here I'm inviting all of you with this wonderful experience that I've seen from Philippines to everywhere. Yesterday I was reflecting. We need the know-how to deliver sustainable micro and small and medium-sized business to make a real difference, to change the concept from a village which is consuming 
to a village that is sufficient to a village that is exporting to a village that's as well, sorry, a village that is producing and exporting after that. We need to do the, a paradigm shift at the grassroots today, not tomorrow. And the money is there, so we're not talking about fundraising. We're talking about putting hands together to get a job done. Because if we do the first 100,000, the rest of the million will be taken care of. And if we do the million, the rest was going to be taken care of, and then the accelerator is going to take place. And if we do one country, which is Egypt, the land of culture, peace, religious, harmony, love, the rest of the region is going to take care of. So my message to you and to all of you, I, th I shared with Joe yesterday, just by co total coincidence, a goal of mine to create the first World Knowledge Fund. Initially, I wanted to do it to make money. And then, two years later, I said, well, I'm going to donate 50% of it for donation. Today, getting older, not old, <laughs> I feel, by the way, I feel 30. I said that I'm going to donate all the money that I'm going to make uh, for a foundation that takes care of people who goes to Harvard, MIT, etc. And in addition, I put together a foundation in the States that helped stimulate others to do funds for knowledge with a focus to Arab world and Africa. And we're ready to serve every single company who's interested to make money or interest, any company who is interested to make a social investment as well, free of charge, or with donation that will go to, to, to young chefs, to focus to build the youth of the current and the future generation. Without this, I don't see the world going forward in terms of inclusion, but rather I, I see it more and more going in terms of divide. So the one word that I would like to leave with you is, again, an, uh, setting an agenda and integrating all the great efforts that you're doing around knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. And I thank you very much. Thank you very much for this inspiring. I think everybody was... Uh, um, very, there was very silent listening to you carefully. Thank you, Hisham. And now I'd like, I'm very honored to present a friend, Joe, Joanne Sawicki, who, has, who is a writer, producer. She is an award-winning writer, producer uh, from the media, media entrepreneur for more than 25 years. And uh, she will be moderating the, the next panel. So a warm applause to Joanne. Thank you, Christopher. Could I call up my panelists, please? Hannah, Nicola, Pamela, and Declan. Where's Declan? While we're waiting for Declan, I'll introduce you to my panelists anyway. <laughs> oh, here he is. <laughs> this panel is all about innovation, and I've got in front of me a group of daring rule breakers. They're called entrepreneurs. And I think that entrepreneurs are very unique characters, having been one myself. Um, as Pamela would say, they're unreasonable. <laughs> and it's that unreasonableness that actually helps create innovation because they don't put up with the norm. They want to change things. So to, my first panelist is Nicola Selia. Nicola is a venture capitalist. Um, he's a partner of Alvin Capital. And he's also a partner in another um, smaller VC that invests in social entrepreneurs. 
Um, I've got Declan Conway. Declan's a serial entrepreneur. Uh, he just can't help himself. <laughs> He's always doing new businesses and all at the same time, very successfully in technology. Uh, Pamela Hartigan. Pamela is the director of the Skoll Centre, which is at the Syed Business School in uh, Oxford, and she's also a co-founder co of Volans. And with me on the other side, she's flown in, and poor girl's very jet-lagged. <laughs> and her name is Hannah Chung, and Hannah is from America, and we have a very special guest with us, which we're going to start to introduce, and his name is Jerry. And I'm going to kick off with Hannah, because Hannah's the youngest member of our panel, but she's also an inventor. And Jerry is an innovation that has um, just come onto the market that is going to cause a paradigm shift in the treatment of children with diabetes. Um, Hannah, could you explain who Jerry is and why he's here today? Sure. Um, hi, my name is Hannah Chung. I'm also the mama bear for Jerry the Bear. Um, so Jerry is an interactive teaching tool for kids with type 1 diabetes. So when kids are diagnosed when they're even you know, 3 and 7 years old, there's a lot of uh, emotional tension that is going through between parents and children. Children are not supposed to touch their medical equipment. Parents are stressed because they have to take care of their child, and the child are too young to understand why their moms are pricking their needles and their skin. Um, so we saw a lot of need for emotional coping and wanted to make learning about diabetes really fun. So this is Jerry, um, and we can, uh, so kids actually take care of Jerry to learn how to manage their diabetes. So uh, you can squeeze his hand to check how he's feeling. I feel great. Jerry is feeling great. Uh, he had a big breakfast, so we had a great time. Um, and so kids actually check his uh, blood sugar level, uh, give him insulin, feed him foods, and actually go through this fun diabetes curriculum, like stories on how to train for the Olympics game for Jerry. Um, so Jerry has been out in the wild. Uh, about 300 families have Jerry in their homes. And even five months of having Jerry, kids are still playing with Jerry for an hour a week. And this is unprompted play. The kids want to learn about diabetes because learning, playing with Jerry is just so much fun. So as a company, Sproutel, our goal is to expand the technology that we made with Jerry to apply to other diseases such as asthma and autism and obesity. And we hope that uh, we can bring a lot of this innovation to unmet chronic diseases that market seems really small, people ignore. But with the technology that we have, we hope to expand that and really bring a lot of smiles to kids with um, diseases. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. And then I'm going to speak to Declan, um, if you can just very briefly summarize your very um, illustrious career as a technology innovator. Thanks, Joe. Um, my own background is as an engineer, so as an engineer you're always looking to solve problems. And uh, back uh, about 15, 16 years ago as the internet started arriving on the scene, the mobile phone industry really hadn't addressed or wasn't even aware of all of the things that we do today. And so uh, I, I established a company at the time that allowed the, the big mobile phone companies, AT&T and Verizon and BT, to be able to build for all of these different services, which, uh, as you know today, anywhere you go around the world, even iPads, you can practically do everything, you know. So as, uh, as tele mobile telephony ended up going into developing worlds, the power of it became uh, quite apparent in terms of solving all of these different problems and opening up opportunities like we've seen in terms of communication and commerce in places that would you'd never expect it. Um, and I guess uh, that experience, because uh, that particular company ended up uh, doing 50, 60 billion transactions a day, became very much like a, a backbone for uh, a lot of um, uh, an infrastructure that's used in, a, a, in pretty much everywhere in the world. And when you apply the same approach of scalability and communications, that the mobile phone industry to other areas, you obviously open up ways of solving social problems. So over, I guess since that time, uh, as that company developed over the last 10 years or so, probably for the second half of my entrepreneurial career, I started looking at taking that technology, that capacity to solve problems in the areas we were here to talk about, around healthcare, around resources, around um, basically microfinance, all of these areas that can benefit. So I'm a, quite an optimist that a lot of these issues that are here can be ultimately solved. 
I think that's the definition of an entrepreneur, isn't it? You, you have to be optimistic when everyone else is looking and saying, I can't see that. You're on top of the hill going, look over there, it's fabulous. <laughs> so Nicola is um, a man who um, makes it possible for entrepreneurs to make their big ideas come alive. How did you, uh, tell me a bit about what you do. So what, uh, what I do, I work for um, a partner in a fund uh, calling Alven Capital, called Alven Capital, which, is, uh, which invests in startups. So we, we invest in very young uh, projects, entrepreneurs come, they cannot find money from banks. So I have a project, but I need money and I need support to, 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 to make it, uh, to realize it. And over the last years, we used to finance uh, all the 50-year-old uh, technologies coming from research centers or state uh, research. And over the last 10 years, we find out that all the great entrepreneurs, the entrepreneurs were greater every year. They were younger every year. They were coming from everywhere. And we realized that at the coming out of business school or engineering school or, or even uh, some people who just had no studies but learned coding, learned the internet, we realized that the model for uh, students were no more bankers, civil servants in France, but really entrepreneurship. I think they all dreamt in front of the, the, the network, the, the movie uh, uh, about Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg. And in schools, now when you go to business school, people, they want to be entrepreneurs. And over the last few years, among these people who are wanting to be an uh, entrepreneur, many of them were saying, wow, it's great to be an entrepreneur, but since I can choose my life, choose my, my project, my company, I'd like to, to do something uh, which makes sense. It's great to sell socks over the internet, but if I could, uh, if I could bring something uh, to the world, something good, it'd be even greater. And that was, we as a venture capital, it was tough to invest in those companies because they were not looking for profitability, but for social impact. Uh, like uh, there was a company called um, Babylon. It's, uh, it enables an uh, internet user to finance microcredit projects everywhere in the world, just disintermediating microcredit. There was another um, kind of Google uh, search engine saying each time you search your engine, we give 30% uh, of our profit to uh, an association that the internet user can choose. It was amazing, but we had money from uh, institutional investors, like uh, yeah, institutional investors. We, themselves, they had foundations or the way to do a social good, and we couldn't take their money to invest in projects which objective, primary objective was not profitability. So I went to my partner, I said, ah, in, in a few months, we are gonna raise a new fund. We should do another small fund, um, a, venture, a social venture capital fund, and propose to our uh, investors to invest in the main Alven fund, but also to co-invest in a small venture capital fund to test these new areas, this new world of uh, social startup. And uh, my partner, ah, let's think about that. And then at the end, they were a bit older. They, well, we shouldn't mix things, it'd be complicated. Either we're on business or we do, uh, we do a social good, but it's gonna be disturbing to, to mix both, uh, both uh, you are not an NGO, uh, an NGOs. So they said, okay, Nicholas, if you like this project, what you could do, take some time on your spare time and see, and you, we give you time to, to, to make this project a real, um, but not within Alven. And so I went, I was in Ashoka with a few other Ashoka guy. Um, we felt that it was the right moment to do that. So we, and we set up Investir et Plus, which is a, a fund who doesn't look for profitability, just to, we, we tell our, our investors, okay, invest, you will uh, maximize the impact, invest in young, talented entrepreneurs. Most of them, we can make their, their um, change the world because of the internet, because of technology, like Annette. Um, and, um, and, uh, and if you can get back your money, that's fine, but uh, uh, that's not the, the aim, it's just to, to, to prove that there's a model, that a company, a startup, can first intend to, be, to have a social impact, and then as a secondary objective, be profitable, so that to be independent, don't depend on the subsidies, on the state, because the state resources are quite scarce these days. Um, so that was a challenge. For the first two years, we were a bit scared because we didn't see good projects. As we see entrepreneurs this is desperate for money, which were painting social on their project, <laughs> but it was not really social, or some uh, people which were so far from business that we felt it was not the right model. And after a few, but we kept going, and uh, after a few, uh, now it has been two years now, and we have found amazing entrepreneurs. We have financed uh, Spark News, which you, uh, Christian Boredon is here, you will hear more about uh, Spark News tomorrow. We have financed uh, another example, is Simplon. He's a guy who was uh, heading a web agency, and he says the world is crazy. 
I cannot find developers in France. We, we have, there's a, a huge lack of developers, of coders, and I have to outsource developing to India or Madagascar. And at the same time, in the poor suburb area of France, 70% of the, the young are unemployed. This is crazy. So it is a simple thing. He went to the, from poor cities and districts, tried to, to find some people unemployed but motivated, and, uh, and did a school, a kind of modern school based on a, a team, uh, team learning, uh, experience learning. And he trained them for six months, and after six months to language like Ruby on Rails or language where we lacked the, the resources. And after six months, this guy, they, have a, they are trained and they can find a job. And, um, and, and the last, and we, we, in our experience, it was quite funny. We, we, we realized that indeed great projects like people like Annette who are changing the world, at the end of the day, they don't need money. And when they came to us, it was not for money. It was because we had set up a network of entrepreneurs uh, who could support them, open doors for them. And the real thing they were looking is really uh, experience sharing, mentorship. And actually, we found out that money was just a link between us, just a, a seal between people who, who can give, share the experience, and entrepreneurs who are feel very much alone. And we were much more comfortable with, uh, with more experienced entrepreneurs uh, helping them. Thank you. So this is where Pamela enters, because Pamela has been very much at the forefront of creating the right environment for these entrepreneurs to, to grow and to become um, more efficient with their network. Could you explain what you're involved with? I guess I've come through a, journey, a long journey as an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur, academic, etc. And um, the one thing that I think, well, there are two, two aspects here. One, there really are very few entrepreneurs in the world. I think everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. Everybody has some inclination to be entrepreneurial. But, um, you know, the theme of this conference is the courage to dare. And I have to say, a lot of people are scared. They are risk averse, and it is hard for them to take that plunge. But they very much want to contribute to the world, and they want to contribute to being part of organizations that are fundamentally innovative and philosophically positive. And so what we do within where we are uh, in the business school, in the Said Business School, and also at Columbia Business School where I teach, is to really bring those different spheres together. They're the entrepreneurs that are the rare breed that is going to go out there and really the visionary, et cetera. But usually, they're not great managers. And they need a team of people that can really operationalize that dream. And so we, um, I think, in the evolution of the thinking that we have done, we have really recognized that it's, the team is as important as the entrepreneur. It takes the entrepreneur to give the vision but it takes the team to actually make that happen. And we see that more and more and more. And um, we also see it now, excitingly enough, within companies. A lot of our um, students, uh, the thing that's very exciting about young people today, and it's really worldwide, is they don't want to separate where they make their money and where they do good. They want to bring these two spheres together. And they really want to have an impact. There's, there's a wonderful uh, poet, Mary Oliver, an American poet, who has a wonderful question that I think we should all be asking us, which is, so what are you going to do with your one and precious life? And I think that very few of us have really asked ourselves that question. We just sort of careen through our careers and, you know, follow this kind of treadmill of, 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 of achievement where, you know, what we make and where we work and et cetera is the most important thing. Um, and I think that young people are now beginning to really reflect, is that the path they want to take? I see, uh, I see it in the kind of recruitment that's done today. So we really try and inspire young people to say, whatever career path you take, you should be entrepreneurial but you may not be an entrepreneur. I think if the world were filled with entrepreneurs, we'd go nuts. <laughs> I mean, having spent a lot of time with entrepreneurs, these are very unusual people. Um, so, you know, I would pity anybody married to an entrepreneur. That's what my husband so. says. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. At any rate, but the thing is, that entrepreneurs need, need people who are going to support that, that vision. So 
I think that that's one of the things that we don't talk enough about. You know, we glorify the heropreneur, but what about the team? Anyway. Okay, so enter Hannah again, because Hannah, you didn't set out to set up a company, did you? No, I didn't. You not. had a, an idea and you got compelled by it. Can you explain how that happened and how you ended up finding the right people around you to make it happen? Yeah, sure. So before I started Jerry the Bear, I actually co-founded this nonprofit called Design for America, which is using uh, design thinking to solve local social problems. So we have uh, lots of, stu like 20 studios across the nation, and what we do is really expand the definition of design, linking into entrepreneurial feelings. And what we do is that if you want to be entrepreneurial, you need to find a problem that you're passionate about. And to find that, you need to go through the design thinking process. So my, the first project of Design for America was to how can you help the lives of people living with diabetes, and that's brought me because my father's family have diabetes, so growing up it was a personal disease to me, so it hooked me. But uh, it was really through making the first prototype, you know, researching that I actually love this problem that I'm solving. And um, it was kind of like an extracurricular project, and I realized I was skipping too many classes working on Jerry. So, uh, I ended up creating classes so that, you know, for mechanical engineering, I need to learn all these engineering skills, but I, I can apply to a project that I'm really passionate about. And I ended up making uh, 10 different projects, uh, classes, with my co-founder, and, and my co-founder even changed his major to study Jerry the Bear. So what we have seen with folks who go through Design for America saying they're designers, even though they're musicians, economists, engineers, because they want to solve problems that they matter. And I think when you have people who are, who have the philosophy and who they are, it's, it's, it's you know, it's, I think similar to the Zermas, so I mean, they're kindling. So you, you connect with them really quickly. And uh, I think that really helped me to find the right teammates who saw the bigger vision, want to solve the right problem, and just uh, were more uh, not afraid to take risks and do whatever it takes to solve the ultimate problem of helping people with diabetes. But you had to make the big leap from being um, an innovation ideas hub mm -hmm. to actually becoming a business because you needed to fund Jerry. Yeah. So what was it like for you to have to suddenly become very business minded? Because there's a point where you have to say, Jerry's good enough, I'm putting this to market. Mm -hmm. When did you know he was ready? I and think how did it feel to, to let him out? Yeah. I, that definitely took a lot of courage. Um, when we so I've, when you made the first prototype when I was a I was a student, you know, your prototype is your baby. You you you're, you are uh, so protective, and you think it's perfect. I mean, the bear that was the first prototype of this was a full model with we hacked out a um, a toy eye that blinks. So Jerry was blink had blinking eyes, and it was just really creepy looking. But for some reason, it looked cute to me. And what happened was, you know. We, we, we went to a child's home to test out this prototype, and we thought, this is a glorious prototype, so kids are going to love it. Um, end up being not. Um, Tell me about what the five-year-olds. Yeah, so I, I learned my biggest lesson that the scariest moment for me is when you test with a child, because childs are so innocent, and they're not afraid to tell you what is right and what is wrong. They're just brutally honest. So when you show this first prototype, the kids are waiting for us, you know, just pulling their hands on the window glass, saying like, oh my gosh, like Jerry the Bear is here. And when we got there, we unveiled this prototype. And the first reaction the child made was, that is Jerry? That is not what I thought. And just ripped everything apart for the whole hour. And, you know, I wanted to cry. Um, How many years had gone into this before? That was four and a half years ago. And then um, since then, what happened was, though, the kids validated the concept that this concept excites them. It's just we need to make a better prototype. So with that start, you know, we, we made uh, 30 different prototypes and tested with about 350 kids. But I think what happened was when we built a second prototype, we realized to make the impact that we want to make and to continue our innovation, it can't be a school project. It can't be a nonprofit. It has to be a venture to continue that. And I think to find the right people early on, talented people, we need to, uh, we need, you know, excited investors to see the vision, to feel us, to make that happen. So I realized to make that impact, it has to be a venture. I'm an engineer, I don't have any business background, what can I do? So that's the moment where you want to be humble, be vulnerable, saying that I don't know anything. 
can you teach me, you know, and have that really close relationship with your mentor. So I think I definitely took the way instead of going to a business school, I learned by failing and testing it out. But I think for me, for who I am, it was the best way to educate myself because everything you try and test it out, you can actually see the impact with the actual family having Jerry. And I'm still learning, but it's actually cool to see how much I matured and learned over time and excited to learn what is else is out there to even expand this business. So Declan, what was your biggest failure? Because we were talking about this last night. The whole th reason that entrepreneurs exist is because they're not scared of failing. They keep getting up again oops, sorry, and, tr and trying again. Uh, a lot of Western culture is about avoiding failure, but entrepreneurs sort of jump right in there. Mm. So what was your biggest failure and what did you learn from it? H how much time have we got? <laughs> <laughs> It, it, you know, it's funny, um, I, I got involved in this whole social entrepreneur side. Um, it was a little bit by accident because I was in Australia and um, I was invited to travel around the Philippines with um, an organization called Opportunity International, which is a fantastic um, international, yeah, which microfinance. a microfinance that effectively at the time had created two million jobs. And I was in this technology world where you can do anything. and. Um, I, I traveled around with um, some incredibly enlightened people that opened up my eyes, obviously, because when you go into an environment and you go into a community and you realize that everyone in that community has to be an entrepreneur to survive, whether you're in a, you know, you're in a little uh, tuck shop or you're in the microfinance world, you literally, if, you, you know, if you're looking after four pigs and they're producing your family's income, one of the pigs that your business is is dead, so they, they, they look after everything so incredibly well. So um, so I was in this world where there was no technology involved, it was all paper-based, dramatically successful in terms of microfinance, like, you know, as a business model, 100% repayment rate for so many years, the most motivated, skilled people you could ever meet. Um, but no one recognized it, or certainly back at this time before Muhammad Yunus was, um, you know, won the Nobel Peace Prize, it wasn't really a recognized sector. Um, so naively, I go in and say I can change the world, you know, because give everyone a computer, give everyone a, a, a phone, you know, you can change it. But then when I was in, you know, as I went around to these different communities and I started figuring out, okay, you can bring a solution, you can bring IT into this sector, I realized, well, actually you can't because there's no electricity to charge the phones. And then you kind of go, I naively went, well, I can sort that out because you can, there's a carbon credit market, you can grow energy effectively and have it funded. So when I got to understand the carbon market, I realized, well, that doesn't work. It's designed by the UN. How could it ever work? <laughs> you, know, you know, so I, I kept making all these mistakes to the point that um, I probably spent about five or six years realizing it was never possible. Until then I realized, well, actually, it is possible because right now we have all of these wonderful technologies that you have all these incredible entrepreneurs who if you just redirect a little bit of their energy into this problem area, they solve it. Like Bitcoin is a really good example. Bitcoin is a free way of moving money anywhere around the world. Why do you need banks for NGOs, right? It's just that simple, right? So, so in very simple terms, uh, all of these problems, all these mistakes led to, um, uh, two years ago, I put together a platform at the Clinton Global Initiative that really showed how you could really fund any project anywhere using a, a, a commerce or a effectively a, a currency that, that traded impacts. And that you built that, the idea came out of your original company, didn't it, about mobile payments? Yeah, because in effect, as, as we all know, every people, everyone in this room right now can contact and do anything they want to do related to their work because they got an iPad. So, you know, uh, in effect, the mobile phone industry, generally under the GSM Association, basically got everyone together to act in a sensible way. And um, as a consequence, you've, you know, six billion people able to communicate. And in fact, I, I brought this idea to the chairman of the uh, GSM Association, which is a guy called Rob Conway at the time, and he said, well, of course, we, tell us what we need, we will help. And I brought it to everyone from the leads and lead guys in Google and Deutsche Telekom, and everybody said, yes, go build it, we'll use it. Because, and, or if you talk to consumers or talk to brands, everybody basically wants to participate in solving this incredibly simple problem to solve if you share it, right? If everyone takes a small proportion. And that's what technology literally enables us to do. 
because as we are now all communicating with Twitter and we got our Facebook, unfortunately, or, or I guess fortunately for people like myself who want to build something, this problem hasn't ultimately been solved. So technically. We were talking last night about how technology has changed the way that entrepreneurs work because when I was starting out as an entrepreneur it was all about protecting your IP and now technology is about sharing intellectual property and it's about the execution, it makes you a better company and, and for example Jerry is an Android technology and you have developers from all over the world helping innovate Jerry. Um, Pamela, how how, is that, how have you seen that change, the, the ideological change from protection to cooperation? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. In fact, um, I don't think we're quite there yet. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at, uh, on the one hand, we have these wonderful movements like the shared economy and we are, you know, much more open, things are open source. But um, what I do see is a tendency for, entrepreneur, for somebody that has a great idea, the first thing they do is kind of say, ooh, I can't share that with anybody because they'll steal it. And I find it sort of naive because if you think you're the only person that ever had that idea, you're smoking something, it's probably other people have had that idea and you're gonna continue to perfect it and perfect it by sharing. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that entrepreneurs, rather when they went, and in this sense I have a very oddly strong criticism of these business plan competitions in, um, in, in academia such as my own where you know you're supposed to the business, as Bill Gates said by the time you have a business plan it's too late at some point you will have to develop a business plan but that's after what Han has done with all the prototyping etc cetera, etc cetera. once you know where your you know what, what your business plan is um, but there's a lot that comes before that and so for that to happen you need to share you really do need to share, but most entrepreneurs that I've noticed want to go into a cave and kind of lock themselves in there and kind of, they fall in love with their idea. And they basically are married to this idea, but you know, you can get many, you can get to the vision that you want through many different pathways. And so that's why sharing and opening, opening discussion is so important because of the fact that, you know, as they say, many heads are important, more are, are certainly better than one. Um, so little by little, I think the tendency is to possess your idea, not share it, et cetera, but, but I think we're slowly coming around to the idea that, that uh, that's not the way to go. Okay, so Nicola, as a VC, traditionally VCs are not known for their love and support of early stage companies. Traditionally, they want to come when there's little risk. Um, your organization is quite unusual because you begin at the very early stage with the entrepreneur. Could you explain how you get around these issues that Pamela's talking about? How do you, how do you align the traditional VC role with how you need to operate with this new breed of people? Well, I think for the new generation, which is bred with the internet, uh, is, is, very, is much more open. So internet, by definition, is open. It's a connection. Uh, the new even uh, the new models, uh, software models, open source. Where it's not one company building a software. It's one guy doing a piece of code, opening it, opening it, giving it to the community. Say, hey guys, alone I won't be able to go as fast as I can. I need your help. And the guy, wow, uh, let's help this guy because it's uh, out of curiosity and passion for free. Uh, and you have uh, great uh, and Android is not uh, was given by Google, but Android is a good, a good example. Google instead of monetizing Android. Say, Okay, guys, I give you for free the code of Android. Do whatever you want to do with it. And in the US, Annette with a teddy bear said, wow, instead of uh, having to develop a, an OS, uh, a software dedicated to uh, diabetes, diabetes uh, diagnostic, sorry, for, uh, for bears, I have it for free uh, done by Google. Um, I think the, the sharing economy is young people. We've invested in a, a car sharing uh, startup where people who own their car say, when they don't use it, they say, oh, my car is for rent, you can rent it for me. And instead of going to a car uh, uh, hi uh, hiring agency, in a renting agency, you can rent the car from your neighbor or from uh, directly from consumer to consumer. At the beginning, we have 40 year old, I said, ah, they won't, people won't like to share cars or, or, um, or car sharing, uh, to, to spend a, a trip with people you don't know, it may be dangerous, people will, will never work. But the young generation, they don't care about Owning cars, cars is not, 
They don't care. They like, they are used to with Airbnb, with the internet. The internet is a sharing tool. They are used to interacting with everybody in the world and they are much more open. And since you were right, now with the internet, you have a business idea, even though you think it's quite secret. Five months later, they have the same idea pop up from everywhere, to, to, from Hong Kong to the US, because of the blog, because of, uh, of, of the, the connection between people. One idea is worth nothing. So, so people tend to realize that, it takes time, they tend to realize that uh, uh, sharing, uh, networking, helping and being helped and acting fast has much more value than, uh, than protecting your ideas. So, so that, that, this is an interesting thing, because I come from the creative industries, and in the creative industries you have 100 ideas a day. You're paid to have ideas. And then I got into the world of finance and I floated a company and I realized that I was considered a very dangerous person because I kept having ideas. And, and all the people that backed me just wanted me to have one idea and just do that. And we were talking um, last night about the second board meeting you ever have. So someone's just raised all the money and the entrepreneurs now, and that first board meeting when they go, well, yes, I know you invested in this, but I've got this other idea. How, what you, you had a name for uh, that yeah, board yeah, meeting? No, yeah. <laughs> no, we, we call it the first meeting, uh, the first board meeting after we invest, we call it the oh shit meeting. Because uh, <laughs> the entrepreneur said a great thing, great business plan, and uh, he spent six months uh, working with us. So when he gets back to work, uh, the, the six months he spent with us, he didn't spend them in the business. And, and, uh, and in six months, uh, he has changed, he has new ideas. So we come very happy with our new investment. And the guys have two bad news. The first is a uh, our metrics are really down, uh, and second, we are going nowhere, have another idea, we should do something different. So the first meeting yeah, between us is, okay, well, did you have your oh shit meeting? Yeah, not yet. <laughs> so so, that's, so uh, that's the nature because with innovation, the definition of innovation is you keep changing and making it better. But there's a, a fine line between, uh, there's a, a moment, I know everyone's ever done an essay you know, at university or anyone's got a piece of work and you've put so much time and energy into getting it and the night before you have to deliver it, you hate it. And you want to throw it up, rip it up. And there's this, this part of the creative process when someone's in labor, they call that the transition stage, where you think, I'm not going to do this anymore, I hate it, I'm going away. And, but that's the time the birth is about to happen. And so how do you recognize Declan as an entrepreneur when it, whether it's your fear of it actually being born or whether the idea is needs to innovate? Mm. When, when do you know to let go of it and try harder or to just keep stick with it? Mm. You know, it's funny, that experience you described, because you only described it last night when we talked about it, would, would be common practice for nearly any innovative process. I think everyone would say, that's happened to me. Mm. Everything is absolutely perfect, but then you could begin to doubt it. And that's the point you know it's going to work. In my own experience, I've done this a number of times. Uh, I feel 100% confident about something when I'm at least sure about it. It's bizarre. It's like a kind of a fog where you, once you can see the fog up here, you know it's going to rise and you're going to see it through. And, and I, I, again, um, I, I, I mentor other entrepreneurs in the context that I say, well, look, why don't you direct some of your time towards impact? So I basically give them the tools so that they can quite easily kind of effectively have this type of network without them having to come to Zermatt, right? Uh, so, so, so you can basically create um, an environment where you can give people the comfort mm -hmm. to expect that fog moment or expect that doubt moment and that's probably a good sign it's working. Or that, you know, all of those things are totally predictable if you look at patterns and, and, and over a period of time you, you recognise those. So know. Pamela, how do you help these entrepreneurs navigate those... Uh, those different stages of, of the emotional s specter? Oh, how do I help them navigate? I listen, and I have a lot of Kleenex in my office. <laughs> I mean, it's very tough. It's very tough. Um, you know, they, they will do exactly, you know, this, the oh shit thing. I now have another idea. I want to completely scratch that. And I think the whole key is just prototyping, testing, prototyping, iterating, prototyping, you know. Um, and there's a wonderful book out that, if anybody um, has, is interested, um, it was published several years ago by um, Randy Commissar and John Mullins, and it's called Getting to Plan B. And it really tracks through how many entrepreneurs, kind of a case study approach of entrepreneurs who started out with this idea, had a great plan A, 
and then it didn't work, and how they kept reiterating and reiterating, and some of them don't do what they're doing until they're down at plan F or G or H, so it takes so many iterations of that. And just, um, I think one of the most important things um, from the point of view of working with um, young, younger and new, new entrepreneurs, because I think one of the, one of the big uh, myths that we have is that to be an entrepreneur, you have to be young and have a garage or something like this. I mean, <laughs> preferably, well, now we're changing that, but usually male, usually sitting in San Francisco. And one of the things that's a big surprise is that there actually is a very, very prolific moment of entrepreneurial endeavor after people retire. Um, and I think that that is something that, you know, holds great hope for many of us. Um, but, but I think that that's something that we need to think about. But for both of these age groups, the most important thing is to bring in people who have done it and can demystify some of these big, scary aspects. Yes, you're going to have doubts. Of course you're going to have doubts. But I've never met an entrepreneur that was afraid. In other words, they have doubts, but they're not fearful. You know what I mean? Do you think that's how you define who's an entrepreneur and who's not? Oh, I hate to get into that kind of stuff <laughs> because, you know, then I'll find an entrepreneur that was terrified. So, um, but, but in general, I find that, you know, they never, they have doubts, but they're not afraid to make a, to make a mistake. I don't know. I don't know if that's your... Question, yeah. At yeah. the beginning, but when it comes but time of doubt, when so kind of time of resilience, when yeah. it's yeah. failing, 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 yeah. then... Yeah. Then the, it's, it's grit. a different story. It's grit. It's stubborn grit. But again, a lot, a lot of entrepreneurs can't let go of an idea. If they yeah. really believe it, it's like they're in the middle of the night, yeah. they're waking up kind of going, no, I can do it. And, and as I say, you meet more and more entrepreneurs, whether they have the ability to execute or the yeah. ability to hire the people, it's irrelevant. Mm. They're just going to keep at it. And um, you can't take a good idea out of a person's mind and kind of disappear it. Yeah. The opposite, it just grows. And then if they regret doing it, mm. uh, sometime in the future, that's their biggest fear. Do you think entrepreneurs do ever regret having tried something? Do you, have, do you ever regret anything that you tried? Yeah, of course. You kind of go, why did I waste my time doing that? That was a crazy idea. But do you ever really <laughs> waste your time? Because isn't it the things that didn't work that you learned just as much from as mm. the things that did? You try to believe that you, you didn't. Uh, really? You, you know, why did I spend all that money and all that time? It was an MBA. I should have went on the beer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Hannah, how have you... T now, tell me a bit about your background, because Hannah's background is quite unique, a little bit like um, our friend from the Bitcoin. She's, her background is Korean, um, and they moved back to America when she was a young girl. And... You had a traditional family with traditional expectations of what you should be doing. Yeah, so a little story of I was born in the United States, but my uh, my parents are professors, so they're very ingrained in academia. Like my uncles, grandparents, like everyone in academia. And I was I grew up saying you will, you should never do business. It's too risky. There are so many people who failed. You should be a professor and teach, and that's the path you should go. And. Uh, what happened was, I mean, the reason why I came back to the United States was that I was really passionate about um, art and math and science. But in Korea, in the education system, you had to choose your major when you're in middle school. And what happened was, if I choose math and science, I can't learn art. If I choose art, I can't learn math up to calculus. I just have to stop before. And I was scared that that's, that is going to harm my creativity. So I decided to leave. Korea on my own to actually homestay and be with a, a foreign family I never met before and learn. And of course, it doesn't mean that I found my passion, but I think... How um, old were you then? Um, I was, I, was uh, I think I was 14 when I came back. And it was actually through uh, learning about, relearning about what design is, because traditionally I thought it was all about packaging. And there's a, one reason why I didn't go to design purposely, because I didn't want to create things that goes to waste. I wanted to solve real problems. Until I went to college, I went to college as a biomedical engineer and thinking that I'm going to make artificial hearts. Bring the hearts, let's make artificial hearts, right? And, but turns out I'm in a chem lab, chemistry lab, 
holding a pipette and all I could think of was just breaking this pipette because I realized I'm an inner maker. I want to make things. I don't want to waste and realized it was not a good fit for me and meeting a lot of cool mentors learned that design is really about solving problems and started figuring out how can I apply my passion using design think process to find what I want to do to help people. And I think that whole journey started, but I think there needs to, I think for um, young generations like me, early 20s, people, kid, like kids don't heard stories growing up. You know, they don't know who else is out there, great entrepreneurs, even women in tech, they don't know who else is out there. So when you don't hear the stories, they're kept in this wrong notion of what technology is, what design is, and they don't know what potential that could be. So I think for entrepreneurs or big businesses, it's really important to show what you guys are doing for common goods, what entrepreneurs are doing to do stories, to inspire young people to find their inner passion to pursue that. And I think um, that's the exact impact we're trying to create with Design for America. You know, I'm one of the ventures that came out of Design for America. We're trying to have more people to pursue your passion, give it back to students to learn, and really help uh, students to figure out you know, how to be an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur, how to continue your entrepreneurial journey. And I think it's all through storytelling. We need to share more stories that these are out there and kids need to learn and get inspired from so that. So Pamela, one of the many things that Pamela does is um, every year in Oxford in the side business, business school, they have something called the Skoll World Forum, which is the most amazing place where entrepreneurs from all over the world, social entrepreneurs, all convene and they all come and share. And the energy in Oxford, it, it's electric. Could you explain to people who don't know about it what, what, what it's about and how it's, it's, it's I think synthesis? It, it really is what Hannah's talking about in terms of the power of stories. And just full disclosure here, I actually have come to hate the term social entrepreneur. Um, I think every entrepreneur should be a social entrepreneur. Um, but the so so for us we bring entrepreneurs that are you know f really f focusing on social change but from a for-profit angle which is very exciting we bring nonprofits who you know have grown and scaled and these are all let's say these are the I mean there's always a danger these are the rock stars of the entrepreneurial world and um, they um, it, it's a little bit like like the Oscars, where you celebrate these people in a way and showcase them through film. Um, as you know, Jeff Skoll also is the owner uh, of, of Participant Productions, which is an incredibly successful um, uh, uh, film producing industry, things like uh, Charlie Wilson's War and uh, Abraham and Lincoln and all of these movies that are produced with a social message. and so. What they do is they package these stories of these people and show them uh, everywhere because just as Hannah says, if you don't know those role models are out there, um, then, then uh, you know, it makes it that much more difficult. In the US, I think, and, and in, in Europe, we're aware of this, but there are many parts of the world where they're not. And there are also cultures that are not particularly, um, how can I say, they're more communal so celebrating one individual goes against their grain, so you have to kind of be culturally sensitive in terms of how you deal with that as well. Um, but uh, uh, I think storytelling is absolutely critical. One of the interesting things I found from attending the Skoll Forum <clears throat> is that you bring in a lot of entrepreneurs from developing countries. Absolutely. And the really interesting thing is a lot of the exciting innovations are coming from the developing world. And they're being brought back into the to Europe and America, and they they work in in, mm -hmm. in developed countries too. Right. Um, that's part of the, right. where you got your inspiration. Yeah, well, I think it? yeah, that's right for microfinance. Yeah. yeah, it's it's actually amazing because if you go to a small community that has nothing, right, everything has to work, right, because uh, you don't really have a kind of a plan B, right. Um, so that's why microbanking or microfinance works because it, you don't really have a way of no. You know, when someone goes in and lends that community five thousand dollars, it's not going to get another five thousand dollars unless it effectively makes it productive, right? And I I really love actually uh, working on projects that are basic, fundamental, like creating you know food or creating an energy system or a, 
delivering water or those really basic human needs or figuring out a healthcare system that will work in a community. When we've all this wonderful technology period, how do you make it work in a community to bring the cost down and make it effective? Because in that environment, if you can get it working for you know a thousand people, you can work. It works for everyone in the world. Then you can take that into crazy screwed up healthcare systems that we all are familiar with and we read about. So, so, so you're you're in an environment where you, you all the building blocks have to work efficiently, simply, in, a, in very really very difficult environments. If they work there, they work everywhere. And it's funny, banking, the future mobile banking is coming from the work that was done in Africa. When, you know, 10 years ago, you have in Kenya, you, the only way you can actually communicate or transfer values by your phone. So quite clearly, that's a very, that's the new wave of technology in the West that's been used 10 years ago in, in Africa. I, th I think a lot of the interesting things is technology is leapfrogged into Africa and the Middle East, like um, uh, Hisham, what he's been doing. And, and people have, um, because they missed the internet, and it went straight to mobiles for a lot of people, yeah. um, there's a lot of really exciting things happening. Well, uh, with leapfrog, like, because we, there's no legacy, it's like uh, if you don't have anything there, you get to use the best technology or the simplest approach. So I, you know, as an investment, uh, I find the projects in Africa or in, call it in the frontier markets to be a lot more exciting. Uh, and a lot more interesting and also a lot more scalable, obviously. Because when you have uh, four billion people are going or going into middle class from effectively out of poverty in many cases, that's a massive market. Whereas a lot of us are chasing around, traditional companies are chasing around, how do I move, I'm in Switzerland, how do I move to Austria, or how do I move, you know. So, so in effect, what I actually do is I spend a lot of time uh, seeking technologies or entrepreneurs who have an incredible technology but haven't really you know, picked up the book on Africa or don't really understand the next two billion consumers are going to come from that area. And what I say is, well, I say, look, can I license your technology or work with you to bring it into the impact area in the total knowledge that is incredibly profitable and hugely scalable and probably be its main market? So, and, yeah. so Nicola, um, I wanted to bring back things to now the personal. Um, you did something very courageous and daring when you were young and how did that shape you now as, a, as an investor when you, when you went sailing around yeah. the world? Um, you gave everything up and just took a year and a half off. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. And I, yeah I, I sailed back from Hong Kong. Uh, I lived five years in Hong Kong. I was living on a sailing boat with the idea to save a bit of money and come back to uh, Brittany uh, sailing. And um, everybody was saying, ah, you're a pirate, don't go to the uh, South China Seas, don't go to the Ocean Ocean, um, the Indian Ocean. But it did, if I, when you love something, you're passionate, it becomes so evident that you don't need courage to do so. Yeah. I think it was obvious, it was my, my dream. So, uh, yeah, really... Uh, How many miles take, did you sail? Uh, 14,000, uh, yeah, 14, yeah. And it's, yeah, it takes more, more, much more courage to do things you, you don't, small things you don't like to do, like uh, yeah, saying things true that you have to say to somebody. It takes a lot more courage every day than uh, doing something for passion. That way, entrepreneurs think they don't need courage when they yeah. created. There's so much into it. But like for wedding, the same. When you get married, you say, ah, that's uh, the, one of the toughest decisions in your life. Why well, you're so brave, but when you when you in the action, it's so natural. But you, you did need both. courage to be uh, to make it last. Like uh, you, when you're entrepreneur, after after five years, ten years, you're an entrepreneur. You're alone. It doesn't work. You're failing, failing, failing. You say, shall I stay or shall I leave? That's, that's where our courage needs to come in. you did the same thing, in. didn't you? you? You both married the woman and you went sailing. Yeah. You did it at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's why, yeah. <laughs> I had a window in my life where I didn't <laughs> need to be brave, so I make the most of it. <laughs> but, but has that, what you learned from that experience, did that help inform you? Because you were with a big French bank and you had a, a very nice lifestyle before you started that. Did that disruption in your life, your self-imposed disruption, did that then help shape how you now look at entrepreneurs, how you work with them? Are you more empathic no, towards them? No, I don't. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it was so natural to do that. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, it was part of my life. It was natural, so no, I, uh, I don't feel the change. Now when I look back, it seems more like an old dream and uh, quite far away and had a different life. But um, no, I don't. I, yeah, I probably. Uh, maybe you. Yeah, maybe your your reaction to you're less afraid. Uh, we've been in some situation we are not very nice uh, when your life was returned, and so afterwards, when uh, when you have to 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 say 
capital uh, to, to face a bankruptcy with the company and a difficult situation. Maybe, yeah, maybe it's part of education. You are you're less, uh, you less stressed, less afraid in a difficult situation. And Declan, you likewise, you would spend a lot of your life being very, very, very focused on business and technology. And then things changed. And, and, and how did that change you? Yeah, I, I think you, you have a moment sometimes where you realise, you know, as I say, okay, what is it about, you know? Because quite often uh, people at a very young age now can be successful in the traditional sense in terms of they build something or they can start a business and, and they, they're sitting at a point kind of going, okay, what now, you know? And that what now moment can end up in many directions. It was a little bit by chance that uh, I ended up sitting in a village look, having incredible admiration from people who had nothing, creating something that I consider to be as powerful as anything in the world, you know? So, um, so I, I think my what now moment was, okay, well, I want to do something. I decided that I wanted to spend half my time creating business and half my time effectively giving it away, right? So there's kind of a balance. But of course, like anything, if you, once you realize you get into this world, it's so far more rewarding to be involved in projects that create value for other people. It's a very selfish thing to do, in fact, because it, you end up um, having this <laughs> most incredible uh, experience. Like even here, everyone who meets here, there's a, a connection between people here that you don't often get in when you're walking down the street in New York and London. So, so in effect, uh, that what now moment for me ended up, I learned uh, the, the stuff I'm doing now will obviously be more rewarding and it's nearly impossible to ever imagine not doing it. So it doesn't have an end in that sense. You know? so, so Pamela, uh, you had a what now uh, moment. You were at the World Health Organization, World you were very high, as World Bank, sorry, you were very high up and then you did something quite radical. Could you explain what happened? Well, I didn't think it was radical at the time. I think Declan said it best when he said anything that comes out of the UN you have to question. I think that um, I mean, innovation. We're talking about innovation. I think that's an oxymoron. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I basically um, was uh, at WHO in, in uh, Grow Harlem, working with Grow Harlem Brundtland, who was the director general at the time, uh, running a big department there. And I got a call from a headhunter who was looking for a managing director of the World Economic Forum. And I can remember saying, you know, I don't know who gave you my name, but I wouldn't work for Klaus Schwab if he were the last man on the face of the earth, which was, of course, probably, you know, uh, the last thing one would say, um, given where I ended up. But the interesting thing was, the more I thought about it, then he said, oh, come on, you know, he was laughing. He said, he's not such a bad guy. He actually um, wants to start a new a new organization, a foundation. And I said, well, of course he does. He's getting old and, you know, he's worried about the afterlife, <laughs> whatever. And so, anyway, I gave him some names and, and, uh, and I kept thinking about that. I kept thinking about, boy, you know, if I really wanted to do something that was um, interesting, I'd go into the belly of the beast and see what's going on in terms of the private sector, how these, you know, the grand lords of, of, of uh, big business operate. And so a month later, I called the headhunter back and I said, remember me? And he goes, oh yeah. And I said, um, I'm very interested in finding out more about this new organization that Schwab wants to start. And he said, well, I don't know anything about that. But long story short, I ended up meeting um, Klaus and Hilde, his wife. And we talked for a long time about what it was that he envisaged, which was basically I'm tired of the protests. I know the model of capitalism isn't fully working for everybody, but what is out there? Um, and I said, there's a lot of stuff that's out there. There are entrepreneurs all over the world. And I told them about Muhammad Yunus, you know, these kinds of, and he was like, people like that actually exist. And I thought, oh, this is just too good to pass up. So the deal was, I write the strategy for what became the Schwab Foundation, and if we agreed, I would go and uh, do that. So that, but it didn't, you know, it was funny, my husband thought I was completely insane, but um, I'm used to that anyway, so it didn't bother me too much. 
Um, <laughs> so that's how I ended up um, uh, starting and helping Klaus and Hildy. And, and the, first, the first thing that they wanted to do was give a million dollars away, which I thought, no, 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 no. You're not going to find just one entrepreneur that you're going to give a million dollars to. You're going to find lots of different entrepreneurs with different models. So anyway, the talk about prototyping and morphing, the strategy changed dramatically within, within the year. But it was certainly the most incredible experience, um, uh, given the fact that um, it was right at the time when you had, you know, the Googles of the world just beginning to spawn and the sales forces, the techno big, big technology companies just beginning to come up. And, um, and it was exciting to mix, you know, the Sergey and Larry's with the entrepreneurs that were changing the world and seeing the impact that that was having on the way they were thinking. So I think in the end, we did have some influence, but it didn't take courage. It was just a lot of fun. And, and Hannah, at the moment, what is it that you're working on that um, you're having to sum up courage to do? What's your next challenge? Yeah, so um, my, my next daring journey is starting in two weeks, which is, uh, so when we shipped out Jerry to families last Christmas, we reached 2% of all newly diagnosed children in the United States. And it struck, and we, we talked to one of the family, and it was a dad with a child with diabetes saying that, you reach 2%, that's really amazing. Why not reach 100%? And why not just even have a button that someone will just fund all bears? Like, you could try that. And then, you know, we thought it was like, oh, you're funny, you know, it's crazy. Like, you know, like nobody has done that. And the more we think about it, it's, let's do it, you know, like, why not? So in two weeks, we're launching this huge campaign to get 100%, um, which is 12,000 Jerry's to all children who need it and bringing, trying to link a lot of, uh, people who are passionate about children's health, diabetes, and even uh, philanthropists to uh, you know, come join. And to reach that, we need uh, $3 million. And we are doing it through crowdfunding. Just as Pamela said, instead of having three million, one check, why not, why not we crowdfund this whole, bring the community, make a community, and spread this word. And of course, it's very daring, but I don't think it's scary. It's just so exciting. And do I know how to get there? Of course not. You know, I'm trying it out. And I think during that two months of that campaign, I think I will learn a lot. But it's, it's just so exciting because the vision, when that actually happens, is just such an amazing picture. So I think, you, you know, that excites us and want to continue that. And I think that will take some courage in terms of how many ideas can we try to find that ultimate solution that could make this happen. And, and, and making sure you keep in the right path. Exactly. Um, yeah. not getting sidetracked, but actually with that campaign experience, how can you fuel more innovation to help other kids? So I think uh, focus, um, but also with having a visionary idea, I think that's the hardest part, but um, I think we'll get there. We'll figure it out, so. <laughs> and and can you, you didn't show exactly what all the things Jerry can do, so while you're here, use this as a pitch. Yeah, sure. Show people why it's so unique, some of the things he can do. So we just checked Jerry's level and he was feeling good. Um, in my pocket, Jerry has different accessories. So he has different food carts and an insulin pen. And as you can see, Jerry has different injection size. So he has two on his legs, two on his arm, two on his butt. And that's actually the common sites where kids uh, give insulin. So to uh, feed him, you just swipe the food across his mouth. And, oh, let me just pull that to the screen. Nom, nom, nom. So uh, Jerry just had a cracker, and it's saying that uh, a cracker is five carbs. And the, the interesting part that our, the doctors really love with Jerry is that kids three to seven, they don't know numbers yet. So how can you simplify the idea of carb values, sugar intakes, in a way that kids can understand? So what we do is we represent it, in, we present it visually. So each dot is five carbs. For one dot of food, you need one dot of insulin. And kids will say, they, they learn correlation. And as they grow older, they link numbers. It makes sense why they had to go through. So um, I can just feed him by uh, pressing this button. And that was a snack. Thanks. Thank you. And now I can use um, his insulin pen and tap it on one of his sites. And it pops up the screen saying, uh, how many insulin do you want to give? So because we gave one dot, I'm going to give him one dot of insulin. So I can just toggle up. Uh, and give him the insulin, 
And of course, if kids don't take care of Jerry well, he's going to feel sick. He's going to say, I'm feeling dizzy. I'm feeling shaky. And this terminology is really important because kids oftentimes, they don't know how to communicate how they're feeling. So what Jerry is explaining symptoms is actually equipping kids what kind of words you should use to, uh, to, ping, to uh, let the parents know when they need help. Um, so there's a lot of uh, in-charge stories that Jerry goes through. Um, the demo is long, so I'm not going to go through that. But if you're interested, just come to me. I'll show it to you. Um, but it's the, the way the kids interact with Jerry is really fascinating. And we always make sure we know the customers really well, do Skype calls, and talk to parents and children to see how they're playing. And I think it's amazing that um, when you have a business that you're really passionate about, it's solving real problems that helps people. Um, I mean, I know my customers by their names. I know like where they're from, where they're located, who their kids are. And I feel like they're my friends, even though I never met them. And I think that's the beauty of it, being, in, being an innovator, being in a startup, that if you solve the right problem, people come to you, you find amazing mentors, and you find amazing bigger corporations who want to help you. And I think uh, we just need more entrepreneurs um, entrepreneurs who are socially minded, as Pamela said, I think that's a feel of the world, not entrepreneurs solving uh, simple, simple, boring problems that just makes Twitter go more viral. I think those are, those drives me nuts. But um, I, I think we need more uh, people doing good, building good businesses, businesses, and making money doing good, good uh, solving good problems. Okay, and I'm just finishing up with Nicola, uh, and we'll go to questions in a minute. So Nicola, uh, what is your aim now for your new fund for social investment? How much money are you going to raise for that? Uh, money, we don't know. It depends on our success. We don't what, want to raise your, too... What would you like to do? We'd like to, to, we'd like to, to have some more entrepreneurs who's with us. Uh, we'll, we'll write uh, wonderful stories like, uh, like Annette. Would this and work in France? Yeah, yeah, but now, yeah, entrepreneurs, uh, the, the two amazing entrepreneurs we saw came from Korea. Uh, if you come from Korea, you can do it from France. Uh, there's a universal uh, community, thanks to the web, to the, to, to the information that's running around the world. Um, uh, what's amazing, it's with technology, it's free. So you have a great new tools, uh, open source is free. A great new tools to, to, to solve a simple problem that couldn't be solved before. And with the internet, you can spread the word everywhere for free as well. So I think the, the internet revolution is, is, uh, is completely uh, enabling entrepreneurs to solve problems in a way that has never, couldn't be imagined. From, uh, and, and, and this with, without any, um, uh, with very limited amount of money. So the simple tools uh, enabling people with great ideas to change the world. And it's true in the education, in any uh, transferring money for free, thanks to Bitcoin. Bitcoin is an amazing, neutral, belonging to nobody, uh, transfer uh, platform, uh, which is completely free. In education, uh, I, I did I participate in a MOOC uh, for um, HEC in finance uh, last, uh, last month. And the MOOC was, was for uh, French students staying at home. And we, 90% of the students, the, there were 5,000 students attending, were from Africa. They just for free, they hook onto the MOOC and they get, uh, they get a finance course for the best finance uh, professor uh, from HEC, which is a French business school. Uh, this is amazing. It's free, easy. You have the idea. Every, uh, the internet and the, the technology are there to make it happen. I think it's, uh, we are the beginning of a, of a huge revolution. As everybody says, I think we need an example, and, uh, which is striking. We have only one uh, social entrepreneur who got real media attraction. It's Mohamed Yunus. There are many other Mohamed Yunus in the world. Before he, was, he got media attraction, people wouldn't care of microcredit. Before Mohamed Yunus, uh, without Mohamed Yunus, Hubert de Boirondon would have never uh, created Contigo. His brother would have never created Spark News. You mentioned Mohamed Yunus. So what does it take to get this guy more media attraction, to get this guy talk to the student, go to the uh, schools? Maybe they are too humble to talk too much as a social entrepreneur, they should go out to the media, go to the school, and, and they, will raise, uh, with, they will raise hundreds of vocations of simple entrepreneurs with simple tools that can solve simple problems with a huge impact worldwide. Thank you. Uh, what I'd like to do now is open up to the audience to ask questions. And I'd like to ask Hisham to come back because um, I'm sure people would like to ask Hisham some questions too.
So, does anyone have any questions? Hi, Marcello. Question I, I have a quick question, Marcello, actually, actually about uh, Hisham and the panel. Uh, I think uh, your words are very inspiring. Thank you so much. Uh, but when you say we need to address the issues that you uh, mentioned, the Middle East and Africa, now the history of the West doing work in the Middle East and Africa hasn't been so successful. So two questions. How do you actually take a more, much more entrepreneurial, social entrepreneurial strategy and make that part of what we could be doing? But secondly, how, given that there are so many entrepreneurs in the Middle East and in Africa, how do we actually start from the entrepreneurs in your countries, in a way inviting some of the entrepreneurs from the West to, and the West and the rest of the world to work with you? So that, I think, is something that, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for the question. First of all, there are straightforward ways and there are more difficult ways. The straightforward, I'm inviting all of you for a Zermet summit version in the Library of Alexandria when I'm privileged to be a board of trustees. I think it will have uh, many, per many benefits. Okay. <laughs> a put hands together uh, there is business, there are opportunities, um, socially as well, culturally, etc. We haven't talked about many, many things here, but let's bridge the gap. And as much as I can, I'm going to be advocate for the group to get more and more. I feel that I'm the, the only person from that part of the world. I've seen a colleague from uh, South Africa. He was pinpointing that uh, here. So we still, we are too little. So first, quick thing, we need to jump. The more difficult thing, which I'm in thinking about, and I think I'm crazy enough to think about it, but I think we need together, together meaning the people here, people in academia, people in politics, etc., to rethink about where we are and where we should be doing. The question I have for you, are you happy with the way things are, with what we see on CNN? If not, can we ask ourselves, why is that happening? To me, I have a view that what we are doing today is basically a product or the framework and the paradigm that we live in is a product of the Second World War paradigm. We haven't, we haven't yet changed anything. You're talking about institutions. These, we invented these institutions 60 years ago. We know that they are not working. They are not functioning. You hinted to that while saying the UN and the World Bank and multinationals. We are every day inventing new institutions like ours to complement the gap that does not exist. Don't we think that we need to have a new shift <coughs> of paradigm politically, economically, and socially to rethink about the new world or we are waiting for the third world war? It's around the corner if we keep it up. Can we get, one day I thought of getting, before he died, the Mandela's of the world. It's another version of the B uh, uh, team. The uh, the to others. try to rethink a group like the San Francisco group that we, uh, back there, in the, uh, right after the second. Maybe we can initiate it from here. Not the Club of Rome. An action-oriented new paradigm group that will influence the lousy politics that exist in many capitals of the world that are driving us more and more down. Second, we, I think, emerging into a capital, a free market with a heart. Theories. But what we apply in practice is different. And I hear 
different buzzwords uh, about social investment, about it. don't we need to push a little bit forward for a new world? We talk about globalization from a perspective, and it depends on where we are. Don't we need to rethink about it? This new generation that is a product of the internet media world, they are thinking totally diff in a different way. Don't we need to invite them to think about how we go about it? So short answer and long answer. The short one, we need to put hands together around quick win, maybe projects, or better programs, or more uh, an actual sustainable ongoing activities like what I said about knowledge. By the way, I didn't talk anything about arts, for example, and the link put between arts and our life. I'm a believer and I put a foundation for arts for all, not arts for elite. And what arts can bring to us, culture, culture for all, religious. Can't we get the top three guys to sit every six months together? so that they can think together about more harmonious words. It's in our heart, it's in our passion, it's in our practice. But there are institutions that need to be thinking together and to be very honest and blunt about it, they need internal reforms about rethinking about the harmony of the world. We do call for it, we advocate it. I just in the Vatican making a speech Huh? Religious reform is there and needed to be done today. We cannot do everything. And with the good heart that we have, with the good intentions that we have, with the positiveness that exists on our, inside us, we need to do this in religion, in culture, in art, in social, in economic, in political. We need a new paradigm in technology. When I sit with my daughter and talk to her, we talk different languages. We are common in one part, she's El Sharif, but we are two different. She studies, I was saying, she's studying political science in uh, uh, King's College London, and her passion is media and entertainment. And guess what? Last week, we were having a brunch, and she told me, my thesis is gonna be about entertainment and politics. I said, wow. It never crossed my mind, and by the way, I have 100 ideas every, every hour, like, like you guys, <laughs> but it never crossed my mind. And she said one word which is very nice. She said, I, I love media and entertainment, and I said, if I love something, I better do it. And I found that this phrase reflects this generation. This generation, are more passionate, are more loving, are more caring about life, about happiness, about live it now, and they're gonna shape it. Maybe we have a bit of wisdom and accumulated knowledge, experience, etc., that we can share with them to help shape a better future. And this is our responsibility. Again, not from a club of Rome perspective, and not from an MIT perspective or a UN perspective, it's the movers and shakers, to put it on the ground. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have another question? Oh, okay. Caroline? Um, uh, which can be really, really scary, actually. Um, but a lot of competition is driven by innovation. Um, do you think that the role competition plays in innovation should be seen as more of a positive or a negative? Uh, who would you like to ask this to? Everyone or yeah, it's... everyone. I don't know. You're all okay. pretty great. <laughs> okay, so start with Hada. Yeah, I think uh, that's a really great question. Um, for us, uh, competition. It depends on how you see it, but we never take it as a negative thing. Um, the, for the work that we are doing with Jerry the Bear, what we see is that if someone else has a similar idea, that's great. They test it out and saved our time to 
test out something that doesn't work, and they actually gave us a data point that that works or that doesn't work. So for us, is the, the, the action that you want to take is, OK, how can you learn from this and make it better? Or how can you learn from the failure and find a different model that actually works? So I think it's important to think about, instead of looking, I think that comes kind of goes back to being really protective about your idea. That, like, that doesn't exist anymore. And I think that comes down to how you view competitors and competitions. I think it's a matter of, we are in a society where with open technology and things like that, everything is so open. So it's a matter of how can you feel that and take it as your advantage to make a better innovative product. So I think that's, that's one of the, uh, I think, attitude that we all need to learn. Of course, um, it's hard to accept, to, to see something that's traditionally negative to be a positive thing for yourself. But um, I, think, I think that's a key to see it, you know, how is that, you know, to seeing it as they help you to find a data point that, that works or it doesn't work, that you can accelerate your time to find the best, to make the best innovative product possible. And sometimes, isn't it, if someone's competing, it means you're on the right path. Because no one would bother if you weren't getting warm. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it shows momentum. If there's more people saying, I think Nicola talked about, you know, one idea starts out, five or six months, there's so many ideas popping out. That means there's momentum, people are interested. So you're definitely on the right track. It's a matter of how you can execute the best. Because I think the same case for YouTube, you know, videos channels existed. YouTube is not the first one, but they did the best job executing it. And I think that's, that's what it takes to be entrepreneurial. It's not about the idea anymore, it's how you execute it. Pamela, what's your thought? Uh, well, I first of all fully agree with the way Hannah has sort of reframed the issue of competition. I think um, in the way that she's presenting it, it's a very good thing. Um, what I find, and going back to the comment about needing to reform institutions that were formed in World War II, um, the thing that is the most frustrating for me is watching how we take um, young people from the primary school grades and instead of teaching them what they're going to need in terms of life skills for cooperation, we actually instill competition in, in the act. It becomes very individual. You work against each other for grades. You work against each other for rankings. You work against each other. And then all of a sudden, you're thrown out into the workforce and you're supposed to work together. And I think that um, we're seeing a pushback in that way um, uh, so that, you know, if we're going to be expected to actually solve global problems together, um, our entire academic institutions need to begin to rethink how they actually do that. I'm not answering your question specifically on, you know, the issues around competition, but I think that we need to reframe the way Hannah has done the good aspects of competition and um, rethink how we actually um, reframe the role of competition within our educational institutions so that it's not about individual excellence against anybody else. Con, Declan? You know, it's actually interesting because um, Anna is a really good example of the future of healthcare, right? Or in fact, the future, future of patient care. So right now I don't know what the size of the market of teddy bears that help you get better, but I assume it's only a little fl sliver of the multi-trillion dollar healthcare sector. And um, I personally don't believe in competition, because I don't think the, the, concept, the concept of competition exists. I think the op probably cooper or, uh, you know, cooperation is probably the best way of describing it. Whether people choose not to cooperate is more a personal and sometimes a stupid decision. But um, if you take this, uh, area that Hannah is dealing with, healthcare is a, uh, and the future of all our well-being and future depends on us having a healthcare system that works and that's uh, a responsive to people's uh, desires and markets. And when you described about you knowing your 300 patients, like, I wish you were my doctor, or, you know, I wish the healthcare system had even that concept. So you talk about, you know, why I don't believe in competition, because I actually believe that the uh, all the future developments in technology and all of these things that are being solved represent amazing markets uh, that we're, I think we're only on the beginning of the cycle of innovation. And we've just now some of the building blocks. And some of those building blocks are, as you described, sharing, 
this idea of Uber or this idea of Airbnb, where everyone intuitively know, in the, you know, from you know the concept of sharing and the concept of having something and using it more effectively, it makes common sense. But we're only now actually having the tools to make that. So when you describe your business in terms of you know you're using crowd sharing as a way of getting funding, that's beautiful because that's involves everybody, involves markets, etc. And if a hundred people do exactly what you're doing you will never even scratch the surface of the patient care sector that you're starting. So if everyone in the world was to do what you did who was capable of doing it, we'd have a healthcare system, we'd live longer, we'd probably get to buy more, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I, I think uh, all the rules are changing and they're changing in front of us. And we see it because we are able to book flights fast and we're able to do the type of things we do on iPads. But in fact, that's an underlying uh, paradigm shift that's happening whether you like it or not. We're going to be sitting in this room and this is all happening. because uh, And we're going to say, how did that happen? Just like we, we experience right now as we're going around with all these wonderful things we can do in our pocket. So, so I, uh, you know, I think it's going to happen. I think the, sh the change has happened. And I think competition doesn't exist as a concept. I think it's, uh, it came from some business schools and people wrote... wrote and, and, Nicola, and Nicola, what about you? You've got shareholders who expect delivery of certain milestones... How do you manage their expectations? Uh, having and it's, 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 we had to Asini, it's about defining your your, your purpose as well. Mm -hmm. What's the ultimate purpose? And and when we we went into a social with this fund Investire Plus, we had to redefine a real purpose. Uh, and because of competition, we say we invest in a project. If another fund invests in a, a, a project that competes that does the same thing, what sh how should we protect our project? Should we keep the information for us and not share it with the other fund. Are there competitors? And that we find out that actually it's a, we should be open. Even if we have a great idea, if uh, it's not the, the company we invested in, uh, which is the best at executing, if we have an idea, the fact to share the idea, somebody else will execute. Maybe another venture capital will make a lot of money, a great success, but at the end, We'll, have, we'll be the source of the idea, so we'll have a huge impact, and we won't have all the pain of executing. So, so it's, it's, that's a great view of sharing. Say, okay, let's share. Our, our, our portfolio companies may be good, but their competitors may be better, more efficient, and have a greater impact. So, so it'd be a success for us, even if a competitor do better, a better job with our idea than, um, than, uh, than the company we invested in. So, and I think this is really also the internet era. It's about collaboration, being open, being accessible to everybody, and that changed the way the, the new generation is, uh, is, um, is facing competition. And where I agree with Hisham, the, this, I think the greatest sign of hope we have in, in the world is this generation. This generation is amazing. They are dedicated, they are, they are practical, they are, they are into action, they are open. They, they learn more on the internet than at school. Uh, but the danger for this generation is there's a gap. There's those who use the tool to discover the world, to change the world, and the other who don't. Like when you are free, um, there's a big gap of the other of this generation who don't do that will be very far away from this innovator. I think that's, and we see the gap in the, the, the young people when we, we receive curriculums. We see outstanding and numerous outstanding curriculums. And the difference with normal, with normal guys, we don't have this passion, is, is, uh, is widening. And that, I think, is going to be tough for, for the second part of this generation. So I'm, I'm noticing... Sure. Um, Can I sure. add one SMS? I would like to put the time frame that I got out of a meeting as such in Silicon Valley recently, that in the next five years, the world is, gonna go, is going to be reinvented again. We are at, at the crossroads of a mega leapfrog where innovation is going to shape our life into a new paradigm. So this is taken care of. What has been s said in the past 30 years, 50 years, the intersection of ICT is now between the science and the ICT, the biology, the chemistry, the physics, and all of this driven and applied to healthcare, to environment, there will be a revolution coming in. Now we need to prepare the society to, to absorb the diffusion of such innovations, whether they are ideas, products, uh, 
paradigm, experience, whatever it is. We need to get ready. The technology is getting faster and faster. Is there only 10% uh, of the internet audience is on mobile. The connected objects are, are only beginning. Uh, mobile internet plus uh, connectivity, every object connected to the web are, are, are two drivers and are only arriving. So we are only, I agree with you, at the very, very, very beginning of the, of the digital revolution. What we're doing is we're combining all of the strengths that we have co individually, collectively, and uh, this thing we call the internet is effectively becoming an intelligent source for solving lots of problems. So if I want to do a patient care project in Africa where we're rolling out clinics there at the moment, from, we're designing from the beginning, I know very well that if I'm trying to educate the people who can't communicate in, an, in the modern Western, teddy bears will work, you know, because they can communicate with something they're familiar with. So what's happening is the, the fact that people can collect all of this information, see it and judge it, and uh, is, is this this revolution? It's phenomenal. We, people, the changes that we're seeing literally the last 18 months, 24 months, they're going to multiply like an, a curve. They're going to double every six months. So I, I do think it's very exciting and all of these problems that we, we now see as being on intractable. You know? Oh, have we got time for one? Fong Lu, would you like a quick question? We've got about a minute. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is a less of a question than uh, than a comment and, and a suggestion. That is, uh, we have covered uh, very exciting topics uh, globally, but then I just want to share some observations from the Asian point of view, especially from China. That very is, important. Uh, uh, the Asian development model, especially China's, uh, is facing a grave challenge, that is, to upgrade it from a low labor, high pollution model into a different one. But then, uh, uh, what that is, is still being discussed and, and tested. But uh, my sense is that social responsibility is not something nice to have. It is a must for, for the Asian development. So uh, what I have seen is not the lack of capital, but lack of ideas, lack of innovation, because um, it, it could be the, the, the traditional Asian way of thinking uh, somehow discourages the, uh, the free thinking and, and, and innovation. So the blast we have is that the modern communication uh, technology has enabled us to transcend the time difference and the cultural difference. But uh, what stands in our way is still the traditional uh, uh, way of thinking there, as well as some over-regulated market. So my wish is that through our collective effort here, especially through uh, the SOMA Summit, uh, we should throw our weight behind uh, this effort to permeate the ideas uh, much faster uh, to the different parts of the world, especially Asia, from my point of view. Thank you. And I think Hannah wanted to say something. Yeah, I want to uh, follow up with that comment and also follow up with Pamela's point on education, the way the academic institution is. I think to Nicola and Jacqueline's point, the internet is a fascinating place because the way kids learn, you don't, in a way, if to over-exaggerate, you don't need to go to school. If you have access to the internet, things are out there so you, you can go to Wikipedia and learn everything you need to learn in, in the really short of a second and it's a way that traditional way of teaching things in the institution no longer works. It can't catch up. The way kids are learning now is different. Even for me, I'm 24 years old, even 12 year old feels, I feel very slow compared to them. So I think what's really important to Pamela's point is we need to recognize how kids are learning differently and we need to bring innovation to the way we teach, teach children because I think, because the way I hope is these children are the people who are going to innovate and we need to feel them as much as possible for giving them a freedom to think. And I think that is also applied to Asia, that instead of keeping kids in a way that doesn't work for them, introduce ways that works for them and let them go and go out and fail and build things. So I think it's really important to have that in the culture. In the way thank we learn. you. I'm going to have to say thank you to you all. Um, and thank you for being such a good audience.
Martin, thank you to Joan for moderating this. So we have a break now until 11. Please come back at 11 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>